Hi, I'm Nicole Bradford, and I'm a core advisor for Brain Mind, and I am here with Dr. Amy Baxter. Amy just gave a fantastic presentation. So, Amy, will you share with us the overview of what you talked about today? Sure, so my research is in the effects of vibration on pain management, neuromodulation, and actually tissue rehabilitation. So I talked about why we have gone as a field to electricity for neuromodulation when it turns out that vibration is much more intense and effective for pain relief. In addition to that, it turns out that different frequencies of vibration we now know do different things to the cells through ion channels that are controlled by mechanical force. So I talked a little bit about all of the different effects of the frequencies that we've been able to achieve with harmonic interactions from different motors that are in concert with each other to not just block pain but also rehabilitate the muscles that are causing them. It's very exciting to me that vibration is really having its moment. One of my questions for you is out of, out of everything, like what do you want most for people to truly understand about what your work and what it means? The biggest thing is that we are so suborned by the pharma industry that we expect every problem to be solved with a pill. When you're dealing with something that is an evolutionary protective system, like pain, you cannot stop it with any one thing because your body's gonna habituate, it's going to get around it. So this is part of why opioids, why gabapentin, why all sorts of attempts to manipulate the brain with chemicals are going to be very short term. What vibration and what other physiologic interventions can do is to work with how we evolve to solve problems, to repair and to rehabilitate rather than trying to end run our own systems. So in particular, I also want people to come away with the knowledge that just like we discovered there's not one frequency that we need for something chronic like low back pain, there's not one right answer. Vibration works better in concert with magnesium, in concert with the proteins that, uh, that oxytocin has. And so this mindset stretching all these things, there's not one right answer. We just want to nail down the physics of one particular one so people can add it to their arsenal. Wow, so from what you said for me to understand, I, I think what you're saying is that with some of the traditional tools people have been using for pain, like the uh, various pharmaceuticals, they do the same thing over and over again. But what frequency and vibration allow you to do, because it's changing, and you said different frequencies and vibrations work for different things, um, the vibrations adapt as, as the pain changes, is that? So yes and, the, that's correct about the vibration part, but the thing is, the body will adapt to go back to its normal groove. And so pain pills, for example, opioids, they will give you a reward stimulus in dopamine for about two days, and then the receptors go, okay, we don't need this much reward, they go away. So most pills are not going to work long term. The body is powerfully good at returning to its natural state, what you have to do is work with the body to get the state to be where you want it to be. But you can't end run physiology and millions of years of development by trying to stop a channel in the brain. The brain's gonna figure out a way around it. Mm -hmm. I was so touched by the examples that you had of people who, whose pain had been mitigated. I have several people that I love who deal with chronic pain and for people who that's their issue, it, it affects their entire life. So I was personally really excited about your talk. So if you had had more time and you could have gone more deeply into something, what is it that you would have expanded on in your talk today? So the reason I'm able to do this is because I got funding from NIDA as part of the Help and Addiction Long Term Program. And one of the NIH's bold goals is to replace pharmaceuticals for pain with therapeutics that are mechanical. So whether it is a vagal nerve stimulator, whether it's an auricular stimulator, whether it's deep brain stimulation, whether it's an external neuromodulator like I'm doing, a whole bunch of different innovations are possible. And the reason to do this is because there is a one-to-one -one connection between the numbers of opioids that are prescribed for pain that 
end up causing new opioid use disorder. About 6.5% of anybody who starts an opioid is genetically going to be predisposed to get addicted. And about 60% of the opioids that are prescribed end up going into a medicine cabinet where someone who's experimental goes and gets it because it seems safe because we've got 10 of these bottles sitting around. So if we could stop prescribing opioids after surgery and for acute pain, not chronic, just talking acute, if we could do that, we would stop our new OUD overnight. We're never going to do that unless we get Medicaid and Medicare to pay for devices as if they're therapeutics. So that is what I would have talked about, is the fact that the FDA and the NIH are kind of hamstrung because people can't even afford a bottle of magnesium, let alone a $65 Vibracool for their knee. So until we get acknowledgement that devices are not only equivalent to but superior to pharmaceuticals, we're not going to be able to stop prescriptions and we're not going to be able to solve the problem that we don't have innovation outside of the pharma industry. Mm. And actually that was one of the, the next questions and I'd love to hear more about it. What are the obstacles or challenges that if this is solved, then your solution can be available at scale a widely available for everyone and anyone who needs it. Like, what, what has to happen? Change the way our laws are written. The problem is that since 1882, Medicaid and Medicare have the responsibility to take care of the health of seniors for illness, for injury, and for bodily malformation. They don't have the appropriations for all of that. So what that means is that over time, different lawmakers have added on codicils, so you have to keep paying for this drug, you have to keep paying for that. And the bodily malformation part means that braces are paid for, but we now know movement is medicine. Bracing is the worst thing you can do for almost every injury. But that gets paid for, so that's what for-profit healthcare makes, is they try to make braces, they try to make things that are gonna immobilize, and that's what we're paying for. So to change this, there are a couple things that need to happen. First of all, it'd be great if we capitated lifetime pharmaceuticals, because if we're capitating my services as a doctor, when someone comes back because their wound gets infected, we should also capitate someone who's on an extremely expensive AFib medication where they could use a cheap warfarin, or where once the company's made X amount, that's where it should be capitated. The other idea would be that Medicaid and Medicare are so strapped for paying for things and people try to end run them in so many ways that they're not paying for innovation except for using old codes that don't reimburse the people who've invested in companies. Mm. If you want to invest in innovation, then you need to have Medicaid and Medicare willing to reimburse at levels that are commensurate with the benefit. So right now what we're doing with the duotherm is it will be the first device that has a de novo code for harmonic mechanical stimulation so hopefully that will allow medicaid and medicare to cover that without having to cover all of the massagers and therapeutic vibrators that would immediately start saying me too me too mm -hmm. um, mostly though we underfund FDA, we underfund NIH, and we underfund CMS. So they don't have the resources to get good scientists to validate what is good science. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the last, the fifth time I tried to get our very inexpensive products covered, they said, we realize all the things from my talk, you know, this is the neuromodulation, this is the neurotransmitter, this is the research that shows that in humans it's definitely not distraction, this, this, this. It is CMS's contention it is distraction. You know, they just, they can't pay for it. They don't have the money. So lots mm -hmm. of uh, complicated ways. I don't know which thread you start to pull to untangle that, that problem. Well, I, I think that leads to a great question about for a lawmaker or a politician or a regulator out there, what can they do? Like, how can they support this for the people who are in their states and communities um, who you know, need the pain, pain management, but they're you know looking for new ways to do it. What like what would you what would you say? I do call. this. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> All right. So the the big thing is physicians are not taught about pain, mm -hmm. and there is a bill right now in the appropriations committee that would pay for 20 million dollars for pain education for physicians, so they know the non drug options and they know that multimodal lots of different things are needed. Second thing is. There is a bill that was passed called Voices for Non-Opioid Choices. It's called the No Pain Act. 
and it was passed at the end of 2022. It was supposed to already be in effect. CMS has dragged their feet. It's going to be in effect January 2025. Mm -hmm. This summer, 2024, CMS is going to put out a guidance. And what a lot of us are afraid of is the things that they have said are for comfort items, um, like what I do, they won't cover. And it's just from a lack of appreciation of the definition of pain. So. Um, the senator from West Virginia is one of the people that first sponsored the bill, and a lot of other senators came on board. So we need for the public to say, we need No Pain Act to cover mechanical stimulation. We need the No Pain Act to cover cryotherapy. We need the No Pain Act to cover these things. Mm -hmm. Which it should, but it's just worried that CMS is gonna weasel out of it somehow. Can you explain in more detail about how vibration therapy works on the neurological level? Oh, sure. So the concept is like if you burn your finger and you stick it under cold water, the pain immediately goes away. We take that for granted. You bump your elbow, you rub it, pain goes away. What's happening is that the nerves that do position sense and feel motion, they are more important for survival than pain. Pain lets you know you need to pull away from the heat, but unless your body is telling you where you are, you can't actively pull away. So because of that, the, the body, when it gets a vibration or a motion sensation, it dumps a certain neurotransmitter in the spine to blanket out the sharp pain nerve, and that way it frees you up so that you can continue to see where you are in space so you can get away from the pain. So this is called spinal gating, and it's been around since the late 50s. People started using vibration to reduce itch and pain, and Wall published that in 1960. In 1965, the gospel according to Melzack and Wall, which we now look at as a oh, gate control theory, posited that something was happening in the spine that was modifying this pain, but didn't talk about whether it was vibration or electricity, and because it was easier to study with electricity in the lab and it made a really nice finite thing, people started moving towards electricity. But actually vibration is vastly more effective. And for vibration, how are you finding it being accepted in the medical community? Um, with humor, usually. I, we actually changed the name of it and, and trademarked MSTEM because people are comfortable with electrical stimulation because it's been around so long and have forgotten a lot of the early research was based on vibration. There's also, there's good vibes, there's the images of the women in the 50s with, you know, jiggling things and, and of course the recreational uses of vibration. So it is difficult to get taken seriously scientifically, which is why we're focusing on mechanical stimulation and on now harmonic mechanical stimulation and the effects of mechanical force and trying to word, avoid the V word. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think MSTEM has legs. And so I'm, I'm curious if you would talk a little bit about your company as well. I started in 2006 making a company so that I could get NIH funding. I had left academia temporarily and I couldn't get the normal NIH route, so I had to do a small business innovative research grant. That company we called Max Miles and Jill for my kids, MMJ Labs. Now that means medical marijuana, so we changed the name to Pain Care Labs. Pain Care Labs was really for stopping needle pain because I was worried about the blood supply and I was worried about kids getting vaccinated when they got older because needle fear has ballooned. Once we realized that there was a bigger opioid reason why we could use vibration to stop acute pain and to help people with chronic pain overcome it, then we realized it was different market channels and we needed to split. So Pain Care Labs is still going well, thank you very much, um, but Duotherm is under the umbrella of Harmonic Pain Solutions and we have other new patents that look at two different pain frequency stimulators used in stereo. So those products are going into the Harmonic Pain Solutions company and Pain Care Labs is still making Buzzy and VibraCool the over-the-counter ones. And if I want to get all of these, how do I do it? Well, we're still waiting to finish our pivotal trial and get FDA clearance and then hopefully CMS coverage for opioid reduction with Duotherm. But for Buzzy or for VibraCool, those are online at paincarelabs.com.
And we do have a compassionate use program for Duotherm that you can noodle around and find. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Nicole. This was a delight.